might be him. Call the meeting to order for Monday, May 6th, 2019. Uh, first thing we need to do is approve the agenda. Is there any changes or additions? I would like to, uh, I got this weekly legislative report. Uh, I printed off a couple papers pertaining to the final stretch of the cannabis discussions they've been happening, happening up at the State House, and I, well, maybe we, we shouldn't do it this week, but maybe we could have a little discussion. I'll just hand you guys there copies of it, and uh, you can take it home and digest it. And maybe next meeting we'll have a little bit of a discussion as to what it's all about. So I guess with that, um, we'll take a uh, motion to approve the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. I'll second that. Okay. No further discussion? All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Consent agenda items just consist of m minutes from April 15th and April 29th meetings. Take a motion for that as well. I'll make a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Yep. Okay. Wish to approve it. Say aye. 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 Public. Is there anybody here from the public thus far that wishes to speak? We're racing right along here. Uh, approval of signage extending in the municipal road right away. Stever. Hey. <clears throat> so the way our zoning regulations are structured, uh, any signs that overhang or, or come into the municipal right of way for streets and roads uh, needs to be approved by the legislative body. Uh, it's a public works issue, quite honestly. Uh, typically, these signs overhang the sidewalk. Think about So Street. Uh, there are a number of these signs. So um, this is an application that we've received from um, Jeff Larkin, uh, Bank Hill LLC. It's for a new shop. I've emailed out some information to you. Steve? Yes. They are here. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi. How are you? Hi. Good. Good. Do you want to introduce yourselves? Hi. Uh, Jimmy Cole. Come wine. up to the mic, please, if oh, you sure. want to speak. It might be off, too. You might have to turn it on. <coughs> Hi. Jimmy Cole, representing the, the Wine Vault. And, uh, yeah, so we have a, a blade sign. Uh, that is um, being proposed to go over, the question mark obviously is that it goes over the sidewalk. Um, done some research on it around town. There are several businesses that already have the exact same type of situation, same size. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the application is, you know, the, the install is very straightforward. The application is very straightforward. I do have uh, designs right here by uh, Wood and Wood. I think Steve has already sent. Oh, sorry, sent. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm just going to pass along the, uh, here's the site plan, and then here's a picture. So, uh. so as you can see, um, we've um, stayed below the, uh, uh, the signage that was allowed to us by Jeff Larkin. Um, and uh, the uh, actual sign itself uh, is being supported by, you know, some some pretty heavy duty stuff, uh, as you can see from the from the from the drawing. Um, the uh, weight on it came in at uh, about 125 to 150 pounds. We're not sure exactly, but it depends a little bit more on uh, the metal that we use uh, for the arm. Uh, with a, uh, we've, we've been debating back and forth. We we honestly want it to be steel because we think it's more uh, solid, obviously, than aluminum. There's several types of aluminum that aren't. As steady, as sturdy, I should say, as uh, as the steel would be. Um, so we're leaning towards the steel, but with the steel, obviously, you have some more weight than the aluminum. So the way our regulations read is, uh, the sign needs to be at least nine feet above the surface of the sidewalk, and that's so we have clearance for the sidewalk plow. So I sure. believe that this meets that yes, it does. requirement. Absolutely. Right, and. Uh, just for the select board, this used to generally be the purview of the trustees, right? Correct. So. Correct. Now that um, the select board has taken over the, all the street rights of ways and issues, right? They, and all the zoning, there's no more zoning. Zoning, there's no more village zoning. That, that is correct. Yeah, this is going to, as I understand, it's going to protrude about three feet 
yep. uh, out from the face of the, uh, this portion of the building, which comes out pretty much to the edge of the sidewalk. So it'll, it'll, it won't go out beyond the curb. It will go out about three feet in, into the sidewalk yep. space. And there's a slight, uh, you know, sort of walkway going into the actual, sorry, it's going into, into the actual door. So it's not really completely, when you look at it, when you measure the three feet out, it's really not completely over the real pedestrian walkaway. It's more actually over the walkaway, walkway going into the uh, building itself. Can you say what the other instances are of this kind of sign in the village? Um, we've got the, uh, the Masons that, uh, above the Stowe Street Emporium, uh, Bluestone, Pizza has a sign. Uh, there are other uh, cases Prohibition where there are structures pig. in the right of way. Prohibition Pig Prohibition has a sign. Pig. I, I'm not sure if there's. Yes, uh, they do have one. But I'm not sure if it overhangs the sidewalk. The one on the pan it, 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 it does, because we, we actually, we actually right. checked that a that bunch of places on it. We came over early to actually check out. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and that came to the trustees tonight. Thank you. Good. And you felt that you prefer this. Why do why you prefer this kind of sign rather than when it's flush against the building? Um, well, for pretty obvious reasons, we want to be seen from Main Street. <laughs> so that's like, you know, it's a key uh, part of being able to, you know, get the traffic that, that goes down Main Street. And you don't think that a, a sign that's up against the building will do that? It's uh, not no. off the ground? No, definitely it. not. You can't see it from one direction completely. So you, you lose the complete uh, people going south. Um, going north, you'd still have some access, but you really got to turn your head to look down and see that. Um, this one, you can actually see it from the corner. When you're standing on that corner, like right in front of the pro pig, looking you know, to the left there, you can really, really see it. Uh, we did some, some shots. Uh, I have some, some, some colored pictures if you guys want well, to see it. Well, I saw it. this one picture. There you go. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Bluestone's got something similar. Yeah. There's another picture that actually shows from the other view kind of coming in from Main Street. That's called looking up from the building, so. I think Craft Beer Cellar has one as yeah, well. Yeah, they do, yes. With a similar concept of being able to see it as you turn on it. Yeah. How much of it is in the right of way? Uh, three feet, approximately. The whole sign? Um, correct. The, the face, as I see it on the plan, the, the, there's a uh, gable end of the building that comes out over the doorway, mm -hmm. and that comes out um, more or less to the edge of the right of way, and then the sign is going to go another three feet. Right. Beyond that, the sidewalk I think is approximately five feet wide in that location. And, and it's in the airspace above the right of way. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And it's high enough that it does not impede our activities. Mark, you got a business here in the village. Any input, output? I like it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. With well, that being said, do we need a motion to uh, one, two questions? We need a motion. To approve this, I suspect, and That's will correct. and will this approval be inclusive for other possible signs coming down the road from other businesses? Uh, no, it's okay. just just for, just this for this particular sign. Okay. okay. That's correct. I'll make a motion to approve the wine vault application for the sign as shown. Okay. Is there a second? James still thinking. Mm -hmm. Questions? You got, I mean, you, you give a second. What's your concern, Jane? I, I don't know. I guess, I guess I just think, I mean, I can understand Mark probably thinks it's, it's real visual, but to me it seems kind of like it's floating out in space and it looks just a little odd to me, sticking out there. That's the great part about it is it's a wine bottle, so it's wine. really obvious that you can <laughs> see that we're selling. And I just wondered if we end up with individually approving many of these if we're going to end up with kind of a hodgepodge of things sticking out from buildings. That yeah, but I don't think our role is to necessarily Well, why be, not? Well, because that's not what the regulation isn't necessarily surrounding if we like something or not. It's yeah. literally what is allowed and what isn't. There's a square footage requirement if a business decides they want to do a wine bottle instead of a flat sign. That's you know, that's up to their choice as long as they're fitting within the square footage requirement. So for me, I, I don't think we should necessarily be judging their choice of design as much as does it fit within the regulations. And then the only requirement is since it is over the right of way, whether or not we approve that. I understand why you'd want a two-sided sign. The regulation for the square footage 
actually allows you for more square footage when you do it this way because it only accounts for it in a 2D perspective. So I think there's an advantage to doing this type of sign. Plus, I think visually I agree that it'll stand out more than a flat sign against. So I understand why a business would want to do it. I have a, a, a sign that is perpendicular to try to get more visual recognition from traffic as it passes. So I understand why, why the choice to do it. But I think that we shouldn't necessarily try to judge too much on design aesthetics. Chris, you, you, I'm sorry. You do need a, you should have a second, even if you no, don't. I, no, them. that's what I tried to say no, to our guest or there, at least second it. And I then would, we maybe can, I just wasn't quite ready to vote on it. I mean, no, no, no. I'm you trying to have to have a second to discuss right. it. Right. So if you second it, then we'll have the discussion. I was waiting for you to oh, second we'll it. Just have, I'll second it. Okay. Now we can continue with our discussion. I mean, even the, there's many businesses along Main Street that have ground-mounted signs that are two-sided. You know, they're not flush. They're, they're trying to be seen by traffic. 46 South Main has a host of hanging right. out over the sidewalk. I guess I need to take a closer look, huh? Yeah, we have, we have a lot of these that are very common. And, um, you know, as Mark said, we don't try to dictate design. Um, clearly, the creativity is uh, a good way to attract. So, yeah, but we, we don't. Well, we I, don't wasn't, have... I wasn't being critical of the wine bottle. It was just um, kind of the, the spacing of it. And yeah, it's very common. Protruding from the building. Three, three feet, I would say, is the norm. Um, you know, whether it's the reservoir <coughs> or craft beer cellars, you know, just to get enough graphic and enough presence, uh, you know, coming out three feet from a building is very typical, <clears throat> and, and they don't, because of the entrance, it's hard to, you know, this is the logical place probably to put a sign in this nature. Okay. So, um, let's be thankful they're not uh, asking to approve a wooden finger. <laughs> <laughs> so most of your field? Yeah, well, I think, uh, from what I heard, Kenny Chesney bought it. Kid Rock. No. Oh, Kid, Kid Rock. Rock. That's who it was. I'm sorry. He brought a, a mock-up of it. The oh, guy he, built a second he's one. He's going to get a duplicate. <laughs> and uh, delivered it. Takes all kinds, right, doesn't it? So motion's been made and seconded to approve the uh, wine vault sign. Uh, is that Elm Street? It is on Elm Street, yes, for the 19 Elm Street building. Right? Or 19 South Main Street building, but it's located on... All those who wish to approve the sign, please say aye. 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 I want to thank you for all the um, thank you. exhibits here. It's helpful. When do you, My pleasure. When, when do you open? Good luck. Open? Uh, in a few weeks, actually. We're, we're going to do a soft opening uh, just before Memorial Day and then be full blast, hopefully, by Memorial Day. Great. Unfortunately, since we had to wait for this, which is no, no fault of you guys, you're just doing your jobs, but uh, we have to postpone the actual sign going up because. It, it won't make it in time for the opening. Sparky's just, uh, uh, Wooden Wood is just a little bit behind where they need a certain amount of time to get it produced. So. Okay. Welcome okay. to the water brand. Thank you. Thanks. Actually, we're actually, we were here before uh, a while ago. Oh, you were? Yeah. Uh, we, we, used to, we used to own Valley Rental. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Oh. Actually, his, his son used to work. Oh, you look familiar. <laughs> <laughs> his son was our shop owner. New venture, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the luck in the world. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, E91 private road name approval for Molten Farm Road. That's you again, Steve. Yes, it is. <clears throat> so I think you're familiar with uh, the Molten Farm across from the post office. Uh, seven acres was uh, retained by the uh, Molten's granddaughter, uh, Andrea, and uh, the rest of the property was sold to Aaron Flint, and it's um, the so-called Winter Woods uh, Knowles development. And um, there's an existing road that um, will serve eight lots, eight houses, single family houses, ultimately. So we need to name it. It's, uh, it's more than two houses on that uh, shared private road. So um, they're proposing that it be Molten Farm Road. And uh, it seems appropriate for the historical significance of the property. Uh, they are going to keep the meadow area all open. The houses are going to be tucked in the wooded areas around the periphery. So I think it's going to retain a lot of the character of the original 
farm, but um, at any rate, that's what's proposed is um, Old Farm Road. Yeah, that project hasn't uh, taken off real, real quick. Do you know of any? They, um, there's a house that's being permitted on a lot too, which is up kind of uh, kitty corner to the Sugar House uh, on the first bend, and um, they did develop one house all the way down below the highway garage. Right, uh, that's yeah. part of the development. Yeah. There is one more that's off uh, Guptel, but um, yeah. I think things are starting to move now. Okay, any, any uh, comments, guys? I'll uh, make a motion for the name approval for Molten Farm Road. I'll second the motion. All right, no further discussion. All those in the favor? Does Boulder stay that says Winter Woods or whatever? Oh, the Knolls? Um, as far as I know, that may still be the name of the, of the uh, subdivision or development, okay. is the Knolls, but uh, they want to. They don't want. To, they didn't want to use that for the main road. Okay. Is that the same situation with Waterbury Commons? Is that Waterbury Commons Road or what's? Um, no, it, it, right. Waterbury Commons is uh, Carry Lane and, and Tyler. Right. Uh, Tyler Lane, Carry Lane. So it's similar. Kind yeah, of it's the development, but they have a different right. road right. name. <clears throat> okay. Okay. All those, all in, all okay. those in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. <laughs> You're all set. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Select board items. Capital planning. Because of this item, I guess. This is your request. It's under the select board <coughs> items. So you mentioned it at the last meeting or the meeting before that you wanted to start having some discussion. I'm not sure if you want to give me direction. I apologize, Frank, if you're here because I think this is more capital planning for um, highways and maybe vehicles, but Frank is the chairperson of the uh, Recreation Committee, so you know, this no rec, the rec Committee obviously has ideas and thoughts uh, communicate through Nick um, and with Bill about fields and other facilities that we have. So we talked a little bit at during budget time. Um, we talked about the fire trucks and you know we've got a couple of pump trucks that we're going to have to buy in the next year or two. Um, so it's just on here so you can start let me know what you're wanting to look for. Right. What, what is, what's the board's concern is, I guess, to give us direction. I asked Bill to come just in case you had something specific. It's easier for him to interact and hear it directly as opposed to just hear it through me. So I asked him to come tonight. So, so before we get into the weeds on that, um, I spoke with a guy today, uh, Jim Bradley from Morrisville, who was just talking in general to me, and he mentioned that the uh, town of Eden, I believe, is interested in purchasing a $350,000 pumper truck. Now, I don't know if they would have any interest in one of ours for next year, as opposed to spending that kind of money. Elmore, okay. There we go. See? Uh, well, if they're, if they're talking about buying a $350,000 pump, it sounds like they're planning to buy something new. Uh, well, I don't know. Yeah. I didn't know if it would be worth a phone call just to, or not. Well, certainly, you know, we're not in a position right now to tell them when it would be ready. Understood. Yeah. The early, yeah we, early bird catches the worm. Yeah. Um, thanks, Josh. Uh, Frank, would you like to come up and talk a little bit about maybe some of your concerns with Take That uh, Food for Thought? And, no, well, I'll just, and I'll just say why I'm here. Frank, you can come up there. Yeah. No, I'll just I'll pop up here. It's okay. Just so we can get it into our heads a little bit. Yeah, so I, this is Frank Spalding. I'm on the Recreation Committee, and I just got uh, appointed voluntold to be chair. Um, <laughs> no, it's okay. um, so, Real quick, I don't really have anything to declare here because um, when the committee, I kind of just came on my own. But um, I will say that the committee has been looking at capital planning as one of our exercises 
in terms of uh, trying to think of what would be a good priority for the, uh, as far as the recreation program is concerned. Um, it's an ongoing process. There's nothing to deliver to you at this point in time. I came tonight, tonight only to get in on the ground floor and just to listen and find out what your priorities are. And so what I'll do on behalf of the committee, and really all I can do on behalf of the committee right now, is extend our offer of assistance. If there's something in the recreation world you want to look, have us look at and, and think about, um, and that we would be, be glad to offer that service to the select board. Um, we are um, embarking on a, a concept, a visioning concept, to really nail down what the committee is going to be about now that we have a full-time recreation director. Um, right. Um, we're really looking forward in that respect. So capital planning, we envision being part of that. So we, I come here tonight simply to listen and offer our services. So use us. We're here for you. That's all I want to say. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, I'll jump in. I think one of the requests that I had put in was kind of listing any equipment that maybe is over a certain price tier, let's say $100,000 estimate, and then getting a, and Bill, I think you said you had this, but basically start to understand the amortization schedules of each of those vehicles and start to see where we might be running into same year hitting big spends so we can start to plan for that. So I think the request was getting just a little bit more, at least maybe visibility on our side of <clears throat> the list of major equipment and it's estimated 2019 replacement costs and then where we are in the life cycle of those items. Um, so we can start because of, similar to the conversation where all of a sudden we were really considering buying um, new fire trucks last year, um, just trying to get ahead of it a little bit as we're also trying to figure out um, you know, road investment and stuff like that. Um, you know, in terms of recreation, conversations around anything associated with those facilities, I don't know if the pool, anything that, anything involved with recreation really hits that price tier that maybe we should really be talking about, which I would think would maybe be six figures, like the 100,000 plus type investments that seem to force us to maybe consider having to do things with the budget. Well, I don't know, if Woody, if you can uh, chime in on this at all as far as uh, where we're at with our paved roads, uh, other infrastructure issues that you foresee coming down the pike here in the immediate future that are going to be heavy hits in the arms that um, are going to play into you know, our, our budget uh, issues here moving forward. Um, I guess my biggest concern is that with all the other issues of re truck replacements and the budgets in general, just trying to get a handle on where we're going to get the money and what kind of monies we're looking at um, to try to fix some of these in infrastructure problems without mortgaging them out beyond the life expectancy of the project itself, if that's possible. I mean, yeah, and I, on the same vein, I was wondering, you know, just to refresh our memories about our priorities for 2019, vis a vis roads, culverts, and bridges, uh, sidewalks, 2020. And is there like a five year plan? Uh, the answer is there's no five year plan. Is it impossible to have a five year plan? There's a possible, possibility of having whatever direction you want to go as far as length of a plan. Um, the upcoming season 2019 schedule has your big ticket item is Loomis Hill. Um, we're replacing a couple culverts, large diameter on there, as well as reclaiming the whole road from the bridge at the bottom all the way to the top. Um, that's eating up the majority of your paving money this year. Um, there's no shortage of projects that are lined up 2020 and so on. Maple Street is another big one that we have. Uh, no price tag on that one yet, but you know the upper part of Blush Hill as well. Um, so there's some there's there's definitely some money that can be spent out there on paving in the future. Uh, we do have E Street and perhaps Jenny Davis Road on the schedule for this year's paving. Nothing is cast in stone as to when things get paved. Nothing's said that it would pave uh, every 13 years or whatever schedule you want to use. Um, 
in the past, I know I, I believe Bill has had Alec Tuscany, the previous public works director and town engineer, come up with a plan on paving schedules. Um, and you know, something like that could be done again. We did look at that a few years ago. Got a proposal from Stantec as to maybe evaluating all the roads, seeing what the best treatment might be for all of them, um, coming up with a time schedule. As you can imagine, most of our roads are due for some sort of treatment, you know, as we speak, you know. Well, the, the, the challenge, and uh, nobody's on the board anymore back to when Alec was first hired as the public works director, but a paving plan was one of the first charges that the select board gave to me and to Alec. And he put one together, and I can't remember now if it was every eight years or 10 years or whatever it was. Um, but it had a price tag that you needed to spend $350,000 a year. And the select board at the time never came close to spending that. So um, I think the, uh, I'm pretty sure it was 350 was the target um, dollar amount. And the most the select board ever put aside in any given year was $200,000 for a number of years. So you automatically kind of got behind and we're here now, where we, where we are now. And I know there's no way that you can um, <clears throat> compel a future board to do anything. I mean, that's one of the beauties of Vermont is that this select board can't bind the next select board, this town meeting can't bind the next town meeting except for debt. That's the only way you can bind a payment is if you go out and you borrow money to do something and you do it. And if you've got a million dollar debt out there, you gotta pay it. Um, and I'm not suggesting that we should just go out there and borrow, but that's really the only way a t a one annual meeting can buy the next is to, is to borrow money. So the challenge is, not only developing the plan, but agreeing that the plan needs to be funded. And, and that's where we've stumbled in the past. We've had some obviously bad luck. Irene definitely got in the way, but it had been several years before Irene came along that the select board was only putting two thirds of the money into the budget that, that they were um, required to do. So, Remind me how much are we spending this year? Do you remember? You know, it's over half a million. Yeah, the last two years, I think yeah. you've done well. We push to have yeah, more. Yes, we, we have. We we really the last two years. This will be the third year of kind of really pushing yes. things with, with pushing the limit. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not saying pushing the limit. No, no, no. It, I it mean definitely pushing the limit on up. what we're squeezing into the paving. It, it, paving. It and we've up. also tried to be in the mix with getting some grants for better better roads grants for yeah, the culverts. We, they we, jump the amount that's available for those. Yeah, we've received a few of those for culvert projects and stream armoring and et cetera. Yeah. Uh, we did try for, I think, a few sidewalk ones that didn't come through, but yeah. I think the other thing that we have to do on paving, and, and this is a trap that maybe I fell into along with the previous select boards, but you know, you've got the class two paving grant out there and there's only so much money to go around. And as we all know, um, you know, going back to 2012, especially if you throw the village in the mix, Waterbury's received a lot of money from the state and the, the district administrators, when they have the ability to issue grants, and I think they do the class two grants, don't they? The district administrators. I believe so. Um, you know, they'll tell you that they encourage you to apply, and they tell you that they'll look at it with wide open eyes, and I believe they do, but they also tell you, you know, there's whatever, 19 other towns in the district, and Waterbury's received a lot of money. The point that I'm getting to is, in the past, we did this with Stowe Street. With the, we had the sidewalk project that took forever because of the uh, historic preservation work that had to be done and all of the F4s or F11s, whatever they are. Um, or Fs. <laughs> and we had, we had intended 
to do the curb, the sidewalk, and the paving of Stowe Street all at the same time. And we just couldn't fit it in with that sidewalk project. But what we've done, probably to our detriment, is, okay, um, Blush Hill, the bottom part of it, is a, is a class two highway. It really needs to be paved. We're gonna do a class two paving grant, and we don't get it, and then we don't do the project. And I think the way the cycle of the paving grants come around is that if you get a class two grant in a given year, find a class two road and, and do it. Always be prepared to submit an application, but also, if it's the year that that road needs to be paved, you just say, we'll do the class two grant the next time it comes around on a different road, and we need to pave the road that's right before us that needs to be paved. Yeah, we tried on Blush Hill for a grant. We, <laughs> we, we, we wait, and we wait. We finally did Blush, Blush Hill. Hill. Yeah. So what happened to the uh, grant for Stowe Street? Did, I, thought, I thought that was just, it was there for us, just kicked down the road until a date that was more appropriate for us to, because of the bridge project, uh, I thought that was still in our clutches. We, did we I don't know what the answer is to that one. I, I'm of a similar understanding, but yeah, yeah I'm, I don't know the answer to that. So one of my questions, um, between what was done on Loomis Hill last year and what's going to be done this year, do you have a sense of the distance of that entire stretch and with the two uh, the cost me? price tags, both the cost and the mileage. Is it a mile and a half? Is it a mile? The whole road's 1.9 or 2.1 miles, as I remember it. Um, we're doing slightly different treatments in that we did from Maple Street intersection to the Jaime Myers Bridge. Um, we did a overlay on that. We did an inch and a half shim coat and I believe an inch and a half top course. From the bridge up will be a full reclaim of the road, meaning they'll come in with the reclaimer, take all the asphalt, incorporate it into the road base, chloride, and then pave back on, I believe, four inches uh, in two lifts. So slightly different treatments, and I'm not sure of the price tag differences um, well, without looking up. Yeah, the differences, but do you, off the top of your head, do you know what it, what last year's uh, appropriation for that section to Jaime Myers Bridge was? Just to give us kind of an idea of what that two miles is going to cost us all said and done? Uh, I don't, but I can have that. I could get that answer for you. Yeah. Um, I didn't know if it was 800000 if it was... Less than that. 600000 yeah. The yeah. whole thing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was less than two hundred thousand to For do that. last year's. I yeah. think it was one hundred and forty, one hundred and eighty. Sounds about right. And, and then we that. were talking about six fifty or seven for the upper part. Was I don't think quite that much, year? but okay. yeah, six maybe. Might be in the seven hundred. So I th I would say seven to eight hundred. Yeah, I can pull those numbers for you and find out. Yeah. Do we know the last the last time that the section that's going to be done this summer was done? Yes. Um, I lived there. <laughs> yeah, there was a gentleman in my office the other day who told me the exact year it was done. I don't have that answer, but he remember, remembered he was a senior in high school. I think 1996, maybe? Yeah, it, it was. 95. That sounds about right, yeah. yeah. It, it, I was still living on Loomis Hill at the time when it, done, when it was done. And I, I think it was. And we moved up the hill to Ripley Road in 97, so probably 94, 95, maybe. That's a while ago. <laughs> yes. And we're finding that with most of our roads, like Whistle Mountain we did last year, hadn't been touched in 23 years or whatever. You know, East Street, the same this year, hasn't been touched in 20 years. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, it shows. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in a perfect well, world, road, we'd have uh, plenty of money like, to do it. But, on, but on the roads like East Street and Whistle Mountain, the, um, not that they were in great shape, but if we could have paid maybe Whistle Mountain two years or three years before, it would have been helpful. We don't need to do those roads, I don't think, every seven or eight years. No. I think those roads have had a base rebuild and what have you. I think we're hitting East Street just at the right time this year. We're, we just milled off an inch and a half and we'll put an inch and a half top on and that'll be fine for a good good portion of time. Whistle Mountain was a little past due. 
Um, a lot of that's the soils up there, but that roadway had been rebuilt. Um, yeah. So the unfortunate part is because of our financial restraints, we are um, kind of handcuffed to just resurfacing these roads on a ongoing basis rather than trying to do anything that might lengthen the life expectancy on the with the subsurface. Uh, I'll say I'm finally getting that through my head, but it's more of uh, the frustration with trying to accomplish uh, some kind of a fix to uh, maybe help these roads last longer. <laughs> well, um, I think, and I don't know how Bill feels about it. I've had some discussions with Alec, but um, you know, I think some of the shorter streets in the village, if we could, would really benefit from the foam application. I think trying to do that on the through roads like Loomis Hill or Perry Hill or Blush Hill, I, I think it's just, just too cost prohibitive to do that. But um, the section of High Street that we put the foam under has really done well. And then the section from Stowe Street to that section that we just paved, you know, that, that no. uh, kind of hump that. is, or depression is starting to show up again. So I think, you know, streets like that, maybe, um, I never can remember, what's the court across Swayze. the street? Swayze Court. I keep wanting to call it Adams Court because Charlie yeah, Adams. Yeah, but Adams is over here. <laughs> Swayze Court. You know, some of the shorter streets, um, we just did Butler and, and Wallace, but those kind of streets, maybe we could incorporate that kind of thing in. But the, uh, the bigger, you know, two mile you know, roads, that. there's just it. no way we can do yeah, that. I, I get it. Like I said, in a perfect world, it'd be nice to have that ability to do that. But that's kind of why, you know, there was this spurt of uh, effort to uh, do repave a lot of these shorter roads so kind of in a sense <laughs> I'll be long gone yeah. before we uh, yeah, ever get around so. to doing those again probably uh. actually to Bill's point it's actually you say we won't ever be able to do it but if you do start with your small roads and you start to <clears throat> you start to use products like foam and hopefully start to get more life out of those roads. If you don't change your, if you do fully fund like we should be doing and we're now over funding the 350, but I know costs have gone up. But to that point, if if you start to get the Swayze courts of the world and the high streets of the world on a much longer time frame of repaving, potentially you can start to then consider bigger projects. Right. You know, so it, it would take time to get you there. Might, you might have to do the bigger projects in segments. Right, right. Um, but I, I would argue that potentially you do get there eventually by starting to just chip away at the smaller ones and learn from that at the same time and not take risk on a big road and then find out there's something inherently wrong with whatever we've come up with. So I, I, don't, I think that's actually a pretty good strategy. It's kind of a hybrid. Well, I think I, right along, I mean, maybe nobody was listening, but that was kind of my strategy to take care of the small roads first. And then with those roads lasting longer, those revenue that would otherwise go to those roads could help go towards some of the bigger sections. And even if we only did, uh, ideally, some of the bigger sections in short, you know, short pieces as we could afford it, again, that's we're looking out many years uh, uh, in order to do something like that. But I guess tonight, what I, my bigger concern is moving forward the next five years, what are we thinking we want to do for uh, paving projects? <clears throat> on the average, what are we looking at for mileage on a per year basis? And, you know, if we're looking at three quarters of a million dollars to do two miles, that's 300 and whatever, uh, 75, uh, 375 a year to do a mile. Although it seems like the last Perry Hill and uh, Guptel, Guptel um, 
Well, Perry Hill and Neil and Flats were both half a million dollar projects, mm -hmm. and those were just a little over a mile, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. uh, so somewhere in the three seventy-five to five hundred thousand dollars a year to get a mile plus or minus done, depending on the application. Yeah, yeah. Um, and to your point there about uh, financing these things out, you can only borrow on infrastructure for for five years. Is that correct? No, no. Unless you. So. Um, before I lose my train of thought, um, just in this conversation here, Jane asked about, is this a five-year plan? You just said about five years. I, I think it would be helpful to us. If you want us to look out five years, that's, that's a lot easier than kind of looking out for forever, basically. And um, I know one of the strategies that the engineering firms have pitched, and the paving companies even. I'm mean, standing up on High Street with John Reynolds when we were doing the foam portion there a couple of years ago. Um, you know, he said, if you can just come in sometimes on a road after seven or eight years and just overlay it, you know, you'll, you'll extend the life of that road for probably 10 years. And, and you, you don't have to really do anything except the overlay. So we could kind of take that approach where if we're gonna spend a half a million dollars, pick our big road if we have to, but um, it might be worthwhile to put $100,000 or so to overlay a road that's that's got people saying, hey, that road over there is a lot worse than this one. What are you paving that for now? And really, if you put that inch overlay on that road and you can save it for another 10 or 15 years right. and then you know, wait a couple of years to do a bigger application on this one. Basically, so, instead of spending half a million dollars every 20 years, you're spending $100,000 every 10 years kind of thing, right? Um, yeah, on, on those roads. So I think, and if we're looking at a five-year plan, I think that's easier for us to kind of sink our teeth into a little bit. Yeah, well, I, I think, think to, point. to Bill's point, we lost a lot of those roads that were, we could do the overlay on the, the Loomis, the Maples, the upper parts of yeah. Barnes. So now you're paying the big money. So now you're paying the big money. Yeah. Yeah. But there's you. probably still a few scattered around. There's probably... <laughs> Like the street I live on. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That would be a Howard Ave. That would be a Howard Ave. Oh, yeah. Got some cracking and stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I like that approach. I've seen analysis from VTrans about how infrastructure for roads goes, and it starts to decline, and then all of a sudden you get to a point where it goes, it nose dives, and it's so much more expensive to yes, bring that road back, bring that bridge back, whatever. So I think some being proactive about that yeah. sounds like you've got and the that experience. Was, that was part of the reason we tackled East Street this year. Uh, we did that overlay on the Hollow Road last yeah. last year in the hope great. that we could save that road from a know, major re right. rehab. Well, even, even Butler and Wallace yeah. were kind of yeah. in that category. Yeah. So. Yeah. Do you do like annually a uh, road inventory and kind of a reassessment of condition and then kind of weigh where that road is in its life cycle? Do we do that? We haven't done that for a while, I think. Um, you were developing a chart there, Woody. Uh, kind of. We've got an Excel spreadsheet that you know lays out when the last treatment was, how much that cost, you know, et cetera. But some of the pavement management stuff that happens now more goes to what you're saying, Mark, as far as this is the existing condition, you know, this is what it might be five years from now, this is what it might be 10 years from now. Well, I think if you could come up with a five-year plan, it also could help with the, what you're talking about, transition for select board members coming and going, but you kind of have a plan where you know where you're going. And I know this, this board has a commitment to <clears throat> back you up and try to fund as much paving as we can. Yeah, as I said, in, in the last few years, I think you've made big steps. Um, 
You know, right. the amount, I think the decision to pave Hollow Road was kind of a, we've got a little extra money, let's do that inch and a half, and, you know, yeah. and to your point, we've, we're running not out of short streets that are inexpensive paving jobs, but we're pretty close to it. You know, there's not a, a lot of short, you know, you've got major streets in the village union left to do sometime along here, but, yeah. you know. Yeah, what's left is big stuff, and it's in pretty bad shape. Most yeah. Of it. So, um, but we're getting a whole new Main Street here shortly. So. Yeah. No, I, I you know, I'm not complaining. I'm just making a point yeah. that that's where we're at. Um, so, to use a figure of half a million dollars ish. Well, that's helpful that, too. If you give us the number and say <laughs> that, and I know you can't commit, right. but, but in general, if you're saying. We'll figure out a way to spend a half a million dollars. I think we can come up with a plan right. to, to do that. It would be ideal if we could use that as a target. Um, but obviously, the things that come to mind are, you know, it's still fresh in my head is the whole ambulance thing and them looking for another possible facility. Um, well, there's never going to be a shortage of things that are out there that right. we might right. have to do something. So how does it, you know how does that how does the main street costs all play into our ability to come up with that half a million every year? I guess that's how do we pull that rabbit out of the hat? Well, I, I think the the opportunity with looking in a five year window is that if we know and and going through the whole list of other capital planning is that you can start to be strategic on trying to stay level funding for the budget but necessary you know take a hundred from paving and put it over here knowing that we might have to on a larger paving project we borrow because that's going to go over the 500 anyways there's if we have a plan we can start to look at what other big budget items might hit on the same year and we plan the, the paving around other timing of other capital Projects, so I think that's where is if we have that plan, then we don't find ourselves, you know, you know, on our heels all of a sudden realizing that everything's coming to a head and we need to do all of this in one year, and then we have to go to the taxpayers or, or borrow, and maybe we didn't need to if we had a better plan. So I think that's the opportunity there is. Yeah, and and you know we're kind of congratulating ourselves in that the last few years we've done quite a bit more, but we've also basically used up all the capital funds. You know, they're brought forward $65,000 or something like that into this year. And, um, you know, we know we're going to have to do some borrowing. So to your question about borrowing, Chris, um, we can borrow up to five years by note. And that just a voice vote at town meeting, you know, shall the voters authorize the town to borrow a half a million dollars to pave XYZ Street. You, you can borrow up to five years by note. Anything beyond five years, you can, uh, you have to go to a bond vote. But there's that little wrinkle, which we did on, on uh, Perry Hill, was we went to the voters and we got the authority to borrow the money for five years, and then the next year, the select board voted to refund the note through the bond bank. It doesn't require a bond vote. The select board just passes a resolution that says, you know what, the, the finances of the town dictate that this capital expense be spread out over a longer period of time. And, you know, I don't take that lightly. I'm not saying that any time that we have a uh, a need out there, we should just go to the voters and get a, a note passed and then kind of roll it into a bond, just kind of as a pro forma thing. That was a, a good reason to do that. We didn't have any other bonding coming down the line. And, uh, you know, we, we had seen the light where some of our bonded indebtedness was going to be dropping off. So we did that. Um, I think coming up, if not... 2020 town meeting, maybe later in the year in 2020, certainly by 2021, we're going to have these fire trucks, we're going to have some pretty big paving projects. You know, I hearken back to when the town set up the first capital improvement fund, and uh, 
we, act, we came up with a list of projects and we just borrowed $650,000 at the time from the bond bank for a 10-year bond. And we didn't spend all that money in the first year. We just, we banked it. We probably spent 200 in that first year and then, you know, used that going down the road. And it was how we seeded the CIP. Um, we used to have one capital improvement plan, fund 30, one capital improvement fund. And then when Rebecca Ellis was on the board, she didn't like the fact that it was all in one fund because she felt like any time there was the money built up, we kind of used it for things that weren't on the, on the list, so to speak. So we divided the capital plan up into five capital funds. But I was just meeting with the auditor the other day, the new auditor, and when you see the audit, when it's finalized, the 2017 audit, and it will be the same in the 2018 audit, he's consolidated that all into one capital fund. He said, it's all, it's one fund. It's, it's set aside for capital expenses. You can't differentiate for it for these things. He said, if it helps you in your planning project process to keep it five funds, that's okay, but we have to consolidate it. It's really one capital fund. And that's how we've been using it. You know, I've talked to you at budget time saying, well, the, the fire department uh, fund has $250,000 in it, the paving fund has $65,000 in it, and the vehicle replacement fund in the highway department is minus $150,000, but we're all above water, we can do what we have to do. So we're, we're managing it really as one fund. It might be nicer to put it back in one fund and, and be able to see all the projects in one fund and, and do it that way. Yeah, I think probably Rebecca's goal was to try to create some form of a discipline type yeah. strategy. Well, the thing that that board did- Separating each. The thing that that board did and Rebecca was um, a kind of a driving force behind it. I think it was really a good idea to put the capital funding into the general fund. We used to, we used to pass a budget, you know, a million dollars for the general fund, a million dollars for the highway fund, raise a certain amount of taxes for each of those funds. And then we raised a tax separately. You know, we're gonna raise a, a tax of four hundred thousand dollars to deposit into the into the CIP. And what you didn't see then was how much does it really cost to run your fire department. So putting the transfer into the fire department and into the highway department and into the rec department makes sense. It's all going into that capital fund, but you're seeing, oh yeah, it, it, it to gives run you, the fire department. It gives you a better it, understanding it, it, it a capital expense to of how much is needed. It allows you to monitor them easier. Yeah. Um, so I've been sitting here struggling with this concept. Is there any validity to, and I may have said this before, if we're looking at a five-year plan, you know what 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 kind of roads are included in a, in the next five years, and if we're half a million dollars a whack, that's two and a half million dollars in the next five years. Considering interest rates, considering other issues, considering the degradation ongoing deg, so we got some one road that's in the fifth year. Uh, and unless you can convince me otherwise, most of our roads are about in the same deterioration realm. Uh, so five years from now, one road's gonna be really in rough shape. Um, is there, does it make sense to think about, even if we have the ability to borrow two and a half million dollars, bond it out for a reasonable amount of years. I don't want to get beyond the life expectancy of the asphalt. Considering that interest rates are, may go up, you know, the other issues that we have coming down the pike, is it, a, is it a good gamble to think about doing something like that? That way we know these roads are going to be fixed. Nothing else is going to get in the way of repairing those and somehow we'll just have to deal with these other issues that are coming. So you're talking about <clears throat> issuing a bond and doing two and a half million dollars in one year? Yeah. All right. So the issuing the bond is the easy part. 
Uh, what's going to happen to interest rates? Who knows? The bigger question, and I'm not looking for an answer tonight, is what's the capacity? How, how much can we do in a, in a year? Um, you know, it's contracted out. We're not doing the paving ourselves. But typically, we, we're going to want to do ditches. If there are culverts there, we're going to want to replace those. We might have to go outside and hire contractors to do some of the prep work, because I'm not sure we can do all of the work that needs to be done if we're going to do $2 million worth of paving in one year. And you're yeah, with, with absolutely, with every paving project comes some sort of ancillary changing of valve boxes, raising of sewer basins, ditching, sweeping, uh, culvert work. There's always, seems like with every project, something that falls under the highway or water or sewer guys. So the other, so you just kind of made the bulb come on there. Um, is there an advantage too to having that much, uh, that volume of paving, possibly look at that volume of paving getting done? And it, what kind of benefit do we get from the paving contractor as well? Um, that might help us out. It's just a thought, you know. I mean, right now I'm grasping at straws because of our ability to fund these things adequately uh, we got to come up with something that's yeah i certainly there's an economy of scale if right. if we're doing a lot um any idea what per ton we're paying now i think loomis hill was coming in at 69 dollars a ton which was because that's it's such a good. such a big project um <clears throat> the way it's structured now we don't get that 69 dollars a ton for east street you know um but is either 69 or 79, I can't remember, but Loomis Hill came in pretty cheap, but that's because it's a half a million dollar project or yeah. what have you. Right. And then, you know, if we, if we do borrow, then you've got to consider that of that half a million dollars, a certain percentage of that half a million dollars has to be eaten up by the debt service unless you're going to pay the debt plus two and a half million dollars worth of work. And if you, you know, Two and a half million dollar. Um, if it's ten years, you know it's two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year just to pay the the principal, and then you got to pay the interest on top of that. So, any idea off the top of your head what we're talking a per penny basis? To see, so it's uh, seventy five thousand for every penny that we that we raise. Yeah, about that. Yeah, that's that's so close enough. Five for, into 250 is what, Mark? <laughs> three, <laughs> three times. Three times. Four or five. Or is it five? five. Um, I guess my concern with that strategy would be if you're doing similar type of roads in all large projects, you're going to time out in the future, potentially, you're going to see these huge, I mean, sure, I, I understand the economy of scale, question mark, but I'd hate to see us set the town up for I, th I think getting a handle on these and staggering by a number of years, the larger road repair projects, I think, and then figuring out a, a, the ability to do these overlays and the maintains to try to strength length of time. I, I, I don't know, I feel like I would be worried about trying to set ourselves up where you know, the depreciation right. and, and, and- But, to, okay, I understand, yeah. to, to that point, wouldn't that actually put us in a better position for doing our simple overlays if we're not burdened by these? But as I understand, Mark, you're worried everything comes due again right. yeah. at the same so, time? Yeah, same time. yeah. I mean, if, if I was presented in a five-year plan that if we accelerated investment in overlays to lengthen road whatever the term would be, um, you know, length that that road can function, life expectancy. Life expectancy. If, if, I mean, of course, I, I love that idea. I love if, if, if an over, a, a series of overlays now, and this is the time where they would need to be done to, to create the life expectancy that instead of having to do a full rebuild, I, yeah, I, I, I'm not against that, but I would have to see that presented to us in that five year, I think, scenario. Um, but I don't think I can really speak to tonight except for the idea that taking two and a half million on bond, you're still gonna have to pay for it, depending on amortization schedules. 
you know, and we're going to have to probably bond for other things. I just would, I don't want to scare the taxpayer with that either. So I think we'd have to have a pretty solid plan if we were to consider something like that. I understand that, but I, to, I think, I think what we've already talked about is the fact that we're beyond our overlay. Or are we? On, on some of the big ones, Maple, Loomis, Upper Blush Hill, yeah. Um, but to Jane's point, Howard, there's a couple in there that we can get, but, um, yeah. Right, there's still some village streets that could be gotten yeah. off, you yeah. know, the bad shelter streets of the so, world yeah. and stuff like that. Well, yeah, Park uh, Street, Park Parts, Park Road, parts of roads, so, too. Yeah. To your point, though, if we're if you're talking about and these are shorter sections of road, right? So, back to the foam thing. Right. <laughs> right. Well, how do you? How do we incorporate it? And you know, we may just have to pick them off. You know, we can do one foam thing a year. You know, just. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is helpful to to me just to keep the horizon at five years and to understand that we have from your perspective right now all things being equal about half a million dollars a year that we can play with and you know we understand there's sidewalks there's culverts there's recreation stuff um, and you know we may have to shave back on that a little bit you know that will be the decision that the select board will ultimately have to make but it gives us a good place to start anyway that we can target that well if the half a million dollars a year kind of projection is there we can work on that basis and if we get a grant for 75,000 then we're at four and a quarter instead of 500,000 right I mean it'd be nice to be able to keep the 500 there yeah, and just yeah. and, and go 575 as opposed to yeah no. <laughs> that would be the ideal is to do more when we get the grants as opposed to you know uh, but We'll, we're not going to get a grant this yeah. year. So. We discussed that if if any of those had come through, we'd like okay, we'll just add another. Yeah. yeah. So how do we, other than just discussing this tonight, how do we kind of move forward with some kind of uh, investigation as to maybe a more appropriate uh, direction? Uh, well, I think I think Bill and and Alec and myself, uh, the three of us, will sit down, talk about the strategy to do this. I know two years ago, you know, Mark wondered if, if it was worthwhile to, you know, pay a consultant to, you know, really come up with a plan. I'd rather start with our in-house folks, uh, and um, uh, you know, we'll have to <coughs> kind of take the lead from Bill in terms of how much time we have. Uh, obviously, he's pretty busy with Main Street this year, and. I'm sure you've got Alec down there from time to time. Yeah, right? yep, absolutely. We'll, uh, the three of us will sit down and talk and come up with a plan and we'll start moving towards it. If we have to come back and tell you that we should do it a different way, we will. But I think for tonight, you don't need to do anything more than that. Yeah, I'd almost start with just a strategy of what's the scenario of road, what are the options based on time and build those rules and then dump in all the data for the roads and it will kind of tell you maybe mm -hmm. how the strategy didn't spend a lot of more time on, you know, the idea of overlay versus rebuild, rebuild, length of road, foam, like, you know, so you could build all those rules and spend a lot of time on that. And then I think once you rolled everything in, maybe the plan would almost make itself with just the rules that you've created ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Kind of lay out the formula on its own, huh? That sounds good. And then any grant opportunities would be now next winter applying for grants mm -hmm. for 2020. Yep. Okay. Now, does Main Street weigh in on the ability to get any of this other funding, or is that just a whole separate thing? In other words, would the state look at you and say, you just got Main Street done. Well, I what think the heck? Main Street's mostly federal, correct, Bill? Uh, so, I, I would think that it's not going to be. I think Main Street so would be less less of a drag on future grants than even still some of the things that happened after Irene, frankly. Yeah. Um, and and some of the state investment that's been made in Waterbury. You know, they built the state complex. They built the roundabout, 
they did the bridges, mm -hmm. uh, you know. So anyway, uh, yep. no need to really speculate on that. Right. We'll just do what we can. So out of the capital planning and right into winter highway maintenance, I think they kind of go hand in hand to some degree. Um, I got this issue of uh, salt use that's just constantly eating at me. Um, I think that's a big contributor to the reason our paved roads are being beaten so bad during the winter. And uh, I guess I'll come right out of the gate saying I'd like to be able to uh, put some some form of a policy together um, sooner than later so that it can be in place for next winter that perhaps uh, basically mandates that certain roads don't get salt use, uh, flatter sections of road. Uh, and start to adjust. And I think actually we had discussed at town meeting, if you remember the input, some of the conversation we had about having a public meeting to talk about possibly doing something different with uh, how we're uh, maintaining our roads during the winter via cutting back on road salt, maybe reducing the heavy amounts of sand we're using at times and doing more spot sanding and on corners and intersections and quite honestly leaving some of the straight sections. That's why I had inquired earlier on about speed limits. I mean, that's a state controlled issue. So basically we're kind of shackled to state rules if we want to try to be more environmentally conscientious about the impacts of salt and sand to our waterways. The only way to reduce that, perhaps, is by slowing down the speed limit on certain spots. Uh, but you can't do that because apparently the state prohibits it. Um, right, I mean, speed limits are supposed to be set for clear and dry conditions. And, you know, you, you're leave it to the driver to to drive for the conditions of the road so do we have any rules on winter maintenance from the state in terms of what their expectations are for not that i'm aware of no um i will say i think it's it's the public's expectation now that um you know this past winter i got called at whatever time a bus could not make it up to the best western you know it's stuck on the hill, and granted, it was a terrible snowstorm. But the public and the Best Western's expectation was, you know, that those 50 patrons could make it to the motel, um, you know, and they unloaded them right in the middle of the hill, and they all grabbed their suitcases up from out of the bus and dragged it up the hill. Um, and I, I would say probably 20 years ago, that wouldn't have been the expectation that you could arrive somewhere in the night and be able to make a bad section of hill. But I think we all know that I'm not asking for hills with 15% plus grade <laughs> to not be uh, uh, taken care of properly. What I'm saying is roads like Neyland Flats, most of Neyland Flats, I mean, that's why they call it the, the flats, because it's flat. And uh, Guptal Road, a lot of Guptal Road gets pounded to death with salt. And quite honestly, from the highway garage down to Grenier's vegetable stand, that hill could be either sanded or reluctantly, I'll say you could put some salt on it, for, but from there on, there's no reason that sand couldn't be applied to that road in, in uh, some areas less than, more, less than others. And, you know, like on the corner by Shanties, you put a little bit more on there. Again, it goes back to people's expectations. And when you give people a wide open door, to drive like hell, they're going to drive like hell. But they will adapt if you get it through their heads. That's why I think a public meeting would be uh, appropriate to have to hear from them. Because I did hear see some people at town meeting shaking their head yes when they agreed to, with me about 
you know, doing something about excessive salt and sand use. Well, I mean, I think there's the environmental, the cost. There's there's a, quite a few things that could be addressed. I know states like Colorado have gone away, I think, from salt on a lot of roads and let the snow pack. But I, I would just want to understand the safety implications of any change to strategy there. And, and as we make these decisions, understand the risk reward we might be taking. But I, I'm, I'm interested in having that conversation. The challenge, I think, and if you talk to people like Celio or even uh, Bubby Wilder, the former highway foreman, is that um, with the uh, warming climate, uh, there's exceptions, but the snow doesn't, it doesn't stay cold enough for the snow to really pack. It becomes this mealy slush. Um, I know when I first came to Vermont and was up in the Northeast Kingdom, you know, they never used salt and uh, they'd plow the snow and, it, you know, the shoes on the plow would leave a, an inch and then after a couple of weeks it would be six inches and then you'd get the January thaw and it'd be, you know, that lots <laughs> that big and then they'd go out with salt then and then take the grater out and scrape it off. And probably back in the day they did that kind of stuff here too. Yeah. Know, but it's, it's definitely a challenge. Um, you know, the cost element, the salt is, you know, we don't have the ability to store salt, so we, we pay probably the biggest retail price that you're going to get because we can't buy salt in the summertime and just let it sit in the shed. Um, What's the cost of one of those sheds? Have we ever looked into that? Uh, so we don't cost, really have the room for it. <laughs> our salt cost went from $69 a ton to towards the end of the winter, I forget when I started 84. seeing the uh, invoices coming through to, to $78. I was going to say 84 maybe. Um, now, I don't know if that cost is going to stay there or if that was just a result of, do we have to put in an allotment or, you know, uh, she, she tells them purchase an allotment from them and once we exceed that allotment, then the price goes up or do, no, do you know? I don't, I don't think so. She, she tells them what she thinks she's going to buy, but I don't believe we're, I don't we're, believe we're paying for, you know, uh, 5,000 tons. And if we go over that, the, you know, the ceiling is no longer there. I don't think that's how we do it. It's not like a pre I know. I but was, the sand is... I, the sand is almost as bad as the salt. I mean, I was out in my end of my driveway yesterday, just you know, trying to rake the uh, daylilies out, and man, a lot. There's a lot of sand there. Yeah, I yeah. had a lot. Of I visited with two to homeowners them. today. Sand issues. Even these are on dirt roads. Yeah, yeah. mine's, mine's yeah. A, a gravel road. Their lawn is like invisible, right? Yeah. <laughs> was it on Maggie's way? No. Uh, one was Ruby Raymond Road, okay, um, and the other one was off a of paved road. Yeah, there again, and I'm not faulting the highway crew, but the mentality is of such a standard that they've been practicing it for so long. They don't want to hear the phone calls. I said it before. Uh, that's part of the, perhaps part of this policy effort that they don't receive the phone calls anymore that the board does and, or the chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's the, per the first part is uh, education. We're edu got to somehow educate the public that we're going to start to change our policy of how we treat our roads during the winter because of the cost aspect, because of the environmental impact, and because of the road degradation. And it's it's. You know, it, what really troubles me sometimes is the way we continue to abuse the planet we live on for, because of our selfishness. Because we are so unwilling to change any aspect of our life because of this mental state that we've gotten ourselves in where we're entitled to have I mean, and I'm speaking from years ago when I remember bumper dragging on Bank Hill <laughs> in the middle of the snowstorm when I was a teenager and vehicles would come by and we'd run out the road and grab the bumper and, yeah. you know, or up on Campbell's Hump there in the you know, middle of the night and the snow was up to your knees and it, it just, it was a whole different world and I understand Did the population was different as well. 
Yeah, I did bumper dragging from Bolton Valley ski area all the way back to Waterbury one year. You did? And, yeah, from route two, down Bolton Valley and across Route Two, and yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. So it was uh, a blast. But yeah, I mean, I can speak to salt usage, particularly in regards to sidewalks, um, in that. I used to plow the sidewalks for years, and back in the early time when we plowed, we only salted the business district, which was an area between along Main Street from Winooski Street to Batchelder Street, both sides of the street, and from Stowe Street to the elementary school. And that was the only area of sidewalk that was salted back in my day when I plowed sidewalks. But you plowed them. But we plowed all, yeah. And you might have put sand down, or? No, normally it was just let it pack, but it sand only in a case of a ice storm type of thing. Um, so it's changed a little there, and, and we are seeing a little bit of salt degradation on some of our concrete sidewalks as well. Where did that change? When to win and how did, do you know that that change occurred? Was it just um, something? Well, the, the business district somewhat expanded. Uh, you know, Napa's like oh, we're, we're a business down here, further on South Main Street. Um, the technology with the machinery made it easier to salt and and what have you, so you could control and load and what have you easier, so you did a little more. Um, and um, yeah. Did you have a, did you pull a trailer? With no, no, did you but a box? they had a box on the back, but after that they went to a box that essentially loaded itself, you could back into and scoop. I loaded with a shovel, so. I like the small business district. That was nice. That was, you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So before I forget, Josh, What's up? didn't you live in a state that prohibited salt use? Yeah, I lived in California. I lived up in the Sierra Nevadas where the hills are steeper and the snow's deeper and they don't salt everything like that. Um, you're just expected to make, maintain a vehicle that can get around. It's your responsibility. And isn't there rules in place that? No, I mean, well, I mean, there's rules like you have to either have all-wheel drive or it's no tires. You have to have chains. You have to chain up if you're going over like summits. If you're going up over like Echo to South Lake Tahoe. But yeah, they don't salt the hell out of it. You need to go to the mic next time when you. Sorry, I don't want to be first. <laughs> so, uh, and I think the state's finally starting to recognize the impacts. Um, and if you watch the news at all, you'll see issues. I talked to a gal up at the. Air grounds there when the, during the expo or whatever it was a home show there that uh, was in charge of the Lake Champlain Basin thing and mm -hmm. she was saying there's one lake in New York that's just destroyed from salt impact and uh, Mirror Lake which I saw on the news there the other night they tried to adjust their salt use to lessen the impact but it's not working um, so. So I don't know where we begin with this. I really want to be serious about it, even if it has to be cut back in stages. I don't mean going from, you know, uh, quitting. Do we know any other packs of data? Do, cold turkey. Do we quitting. have some scientific evidence of how much degradation is occurring due to salt? Or are there other towns that are ahead that? of us, maybe on this yeah. that we could look to to what maybe are other towns they've already made doing? that transition and no. Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Saying, I don't know if we have evidence, Jane. Yeah. I mean, we have we have anecdotal evidence. We know, as Bill said, you know, we've got some sidewalks, and and with salt, you know, um, when we did when we put the new sidewalk in on Stowe Street, we made a conscious decision not to salt that sidewalk the first year anyway, just to let there be some curing time, and uh, you know, we have some places where the you know, the patina on the top is kind of, you know, it didn't cure enough. Uh, Falling. That falls out. Um, but clearly, I mean, when you see, there's places that you can go anywhere, and I was noticing it when I was raking my own yard yesterday. You know, you got hardwood trees that probably have, over the years, there's, there's a foot of sand that's built up around the trunks of those trees. It can't be doing many favors. I think that there's something to what you said, um, both of you said, uh, first of all, about climate. And I mean, I know my own driveway this winter, I've never seen it so icy on a regular basis. And you know, we have tenants in our house. I, I was really aware of that and went out and spent a lot more money on sand myself than I usually do because I don't want anybody to fall down out there. Um, 
a lot of anecdotally people I know who broke bones this winter falling. And then also expectations. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. People expect to be able to And it's, it's do difficult the to quantify year to year what right. you view is because every winter is just so different. Unique, um, right. Yeah. Well, uh, so. it wasn't all that long ago. I mean, um, you probably, well, and you too, Chris, but I'm sure you experienced it as a kid growing up. But I remember when Howard Ripley uh, was the highway foreman when I first came to town. And he told me, he said, you know, until recently, we didn't go out until it stopped snowing. You know, we'd just wait for the snowstorm to stop, then we'd go out and clean up. And, yeah. you know, we certainly there's been school buses for a long time, but in the village, you didn't have to worry about it. I'm sure everybody in the village, when you went to school, even that lived down here, yeah. probably well, walked to school. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Jane, you mentioned two things here. You mentioned the climate change. What do you suppose got us there? Abuses like this. You know, uh, and to the to the Lake Champlain Lake cleanup Champlain. efforts. You know, part of our mandated uh, practices has to be stone line ditches. You know, how long do you think those stone line ditches are going to last before they're totally contaminated with sand? You know, we got to clean them back. Got to pull them out. <laughs> <laughs> pull the stones out and take the sand out. Two years, back. maybe three, they're done for. Realistically, so. That's another aspect that it's going to continue to cost us money. Mm -hmm. So either we start to learn mentally to approach driving down our roads differently, or we just continue to do the same. Well, I guess uh, my question would be is, what's the next step? Public meeting. Input. And the hope out of that would be to get the public interest in the idea of doing something like this. And then the next step after that is actually making a plan for the following winter season and trying X, Y, Z and seeing how it goes, I guess. Ask, them, ask them how they feel about it. Ask them, are you, would you be interested in allowing, you know, a, a modification of our practices going over the next couple of years and coming back to a point where we still have public safety in mind, but we're using a lot less product I guess I would be of the feeling that we could probably make those directives without necessarily calling a public meeting unless you feel there's going to be too many people on either side of this. No. I think I think if the public yeah. knows that this is coming, there will be less phone calls saying, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, I just, I'm, I just feel like we could just start, start to talk about seeing if we can start to cut back and start to be a little strategic on how we use salt instead of just you know creating a little bit more of a rule-based i don't know how hard that is from your end uh, in terms of personnel and, and teaching them to do certain sections and i don't know how much you have to deal with different people driving the trucks at different times and everyone following the same strategy i'm sure it gets a little more complicated but well part of it part of the strategy i believe like anything humans do if you're forced to have a limited salt quantity, then you're forced to have to strategically use it as you're supposed to, rather than thinking that there's a never ending supply of it. That's to try to talk to guys that have been doing it for 20 years. You, you know, you maybe you should change your way a little bit here. It just, there's gotta be a, a bigger force at hand here to uh, make this work. I mean, what, we've already exhausted our year's salt budget. So my the, question is, are, we, are we really increasing the amount of salt that we have been using over the last five years or 10 years? As I said, we're not looking at the data. You know, some winters know. are worse than others. So. Yeah. You can get that information. I mean, I know. I, yeah. I guess sure I want some quantification. So but, yeah, but winter started in November 1st right. this year, this past season. Um, yeah, and it well, we just started right at things I, practically yeah. Halloween. Yeah, I think what bothers me is I don't I don't understand the reluctance to try to do something different. It's, I'm not reluctant. No, I don't think there's a reluctance on either our side. I, I want to understand how the best strategy of this. Do you try to limit the amount of salt, or do you just start to create the rules on where you salt and where you don't? 
and try to follow those rules, but not necessarily limit yourself to the amount of salt because you never know how winter is going to play out. I understand that. Um, I think we always have to go in with a certain budget for salt anyways, and then we just have the winter we have. But, you know, just the strategy of the Neyland Flats of the world or whatever roads that, um, you know, we think we could start pulling back salt completely or to a certain percentage, I would feel like that might be the better strategy to go about this. Um, my other question, and, and I know we're talking about pulling back on salt, but have we ever looked at, I know you said maybe the highway um, building area doesn't have a space for salt storage, but I would be interested in understanding what amount of space we would need to store salt, the annual cost and how much we'd save, and it doesn't make sense to do, put that on the capital improvement list to, you know, in the long term, save if it's significant dollars. What's this, you know, a Quinset hut or something, some kind of... Yeah, I had some experience with salt sheds for my job a few years back, and they're surprisingly more expensive than you think. <laughs> now, some of the temporary structures um, are cheaper, like, like you're talking about, like a Quonset hut or type thing. They, they run the risk of possibly in a big wind event being, you know... Taken. Torn apart. Um, V-Trans has some basic plans that are just stacked concrete with <clears throat> timber. Um, the issue we run into is if there's not a space at the town garage, that's where you load and send out your salt. Um, if you have to build your salt shed off-site, then you have to truck that yeah. to where the vehicles leave or the vehicles have to go there to be loaded or... They had, there were some grants uh, through the Better Roads program that I managed, and the, those, you know, you had to follow federal guidelines for procurement and put them out to bid. We're talking 300000 350 for salt sheds. And, and we would have to buy land to do it. We don't have yeah. Well, I think I was going to say there that if uh, the ambulance department ends up finding an alternative site, the yeah. ability to have a salt shed may present itself mm -hmm. with the structure that's currently being housed with the ambulance now. So that could come down the road. Uh, I guess at that time. I had more than one town in that program pull the plug because they realized how much it was going to cost to go through the federal grant program. And they just went out and built it themselves. Yeah. But anyway, that's a, that's a thought about the town garage. Which, one, which town had the salt shed that fell over or blew over or some? Said, uh, I know the contractor got in trouble. Um, <laughs> Is that Lewis thing? <laughs> Somewhere down that direction. They're building it, yeah. Yeah. So, See, I think Virgin's just, somebody was just telling me the other day that they finally lost their battle with their salt shed down there, I believe, because they were trying to um, do away with it, you know, the, the permits to. Somebody was just telling me that there the other day. It had been, it'd been in court for years. And, uh, oh, there was one in. They finally um, lost. Charlotte, on the railroad right away? Yeah, yeah right. that's right. That's where it was, yeah. And it was down that way somewhere. Well, again, I think we can have this conversation, talk about it. Um, the board can decide whether you want to have a public information meeting or not. Um, well, I think the public, from my eyes, at town meeting, they were kind of interested in having the discussion. And I don't know what bad would come from it other than if 40 people showed up with bats in their hands, said no way, you know? Yeah, I think you need to prove to people that the roads are still going to be just as safe. Well. Or they're not going to be happy. That's safe, hard. Just as safe under what standards? Dr driving like a bat out of hell or, or being responsible and doing the right thing, not only for the town's budget, the environment, and for the road conditions themselves. I mean, you can't bathe paved roads in water through the entire winter and expect they're going to stay in good shape because that's just not the way it works. They just get beat to hell. So anyway, parking enforcement. Let's jump off from something else besides. Done with me. I'm all well set. Thanks for coming, Bill. Thanks, Thanks Bill. Bill. Yeah, well, as far as recreation capital improvements, the lights just went out of the field unexpectedly during the ball game. So. Uh -huh. uh oh. <clears throat> Somebody hit a home run here. Yeah. <laughs> Playing in the dark. <laughs> We're in the process of getting new lights over there, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure what the problem. Not was specifically tonight, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Um, we touched on this a little bit the other day. Um, we have, we adopted a parking ordinance um, because the village was going away. And uh, we talked about the parking ordinance the last time when the woman from Henders Bakery was here. Um, and we do have two hour parking, uh, time limited parking in several spots along the village. We have places up by the school that it's supposed to be no parking. And uh, you know, the, they had donuts for dads a couple of weeks ago. And Gary Dillon sent that to me and said, you know, if we had to get a fire truck up to Whistle Mountain, That's what that was. how are we gonna how are we gonna do this? Um, so we don't have any money in the budget for an enforcement officer. I don't know if there's any um, inclination to try to let this car stuck with its wheel. Yeah, I, I think he <laughs> just, sure I, saw. I just think he <laughs> came out of that parking lot and decided to try to get a little closer to the bank and went over. I don't know if he got stuck there or not, but I saw the same thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's any I didn't see that one. any uh, inclination on the board's part to circumvent, if you will, the budgeting process and try to hire an enforcement officer. Clearly, if we did, um, the enforcement officer would generate some money for tickets, but I don't think it would generate enough to cover the cost of having an enforcement officer. Um, it may be something that you want to talk about in next year's budget. Uh, next year, the Main Street project will be in the business district of the village. Um, Mark's a business person. I know there was a lot of comments and uh, conversation with business owners back when we had the village police department about having the parking ordinances enforced a little bit more consistently. Uh, the last year that, I guess it was the last two years, the village had its police department. The trustees actually authorized me to hire a parking enforcement officer who wasn't a police officer. And we didn't even get an applicant for the job. I think I mentioned that to you at the last meeting. So I'm just raising the issue. Um, we have problems around the school a lot, and this is another area that we can harken back to the old days. I mean, we pay a fortune for buses, but the number of people who decide they need to drop their kids off or pick their kids up from school, and I'm not making a judgment. If they, for whatever reason, they decide they have to do that. And if you go over on Stowe Street, any school afternoon, uh, especially, it's, it's hard to get through there. I, I, I lived there for over 10 years. <laughs> I would just avoid my house at those hours of the yeah. day. So that's another situation of we don't want to sacrifice anything for the sake of ourselves. I mean, clearly, if I had my way about it, there'd be a rule in place that says you don't drop your kid off personally with your vehicle unless you're going by that school to go to work. Well, part of the problem is, is that years ago, I used to actually see the Waterbury Police Department handling that scenario and making sure that people weren't parking on the side of the road, kind of queuing up. You know, they were moving people along, even ticketing people. The contracted police department, I don't think we've empowered them to do some of that, maybe, you know, or any of it. So, it won't. I mean, right. So that's, that's the hard part about the contracted scenario is if we did have a town police department that wasn't in this contract, some of this conversation could potentially be avoided. Um, but again, it's where, you know, what size are we talking about and, and the, you know, what other duties do they have in front of them? But that's the unfortunate part of that contract. And I think we knew that going in, but yeah, I mean, I've definitely heard people complain about downtown, especially recently with just some of the construction that's happening at different businesses down there that there's contractor vehicles parked there all day, trailers over the weekend, you know, it's just, you know, there's no rule. <laughs> People could park there so, permanently for the summer now because it, there's no midnight tow rule. You could literally just park a third car there, or second car, and leave it there forever. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's my night to be a pain in the ass, but um, one of my pet peeves here is um, 
Well, first I'm going to ask you, who has the right to set the uh, parking fines? Is that another state no, no. That's ability or is that... So we have the full right to set the parking fine at whatever we want to set it at. Yep. Okay. That might be the first intelligent step forward to make a parking fine, uh, I won't say so excessive, but so painful that people would want to abide by the parking rules that are set in place. But I think before you worry about increasing the fine, no, what, to my point. Enforcement officer. Right, to my point. If if we charge enough, maybe we can afford to have a private officer that will be paid enough to want to take on that type of a project or, you know, job. Right. Uh, well, there's nothing prescribed in law that I know of, Chris, um, that, you know, the, there's... I think the handicap parking spot violation set by state law, um, you have to be careful to be reasonable. If, if you, you know, if you decided you want a parking ticket be $100, you know, if somebody's parked there, it's a two hour, two hour parking limit and they're there two and a half hours and you give them a $100 ticket, I think that if they went to court and challenged that, the judge would probably say that's not uh, a reasonable fine. To I think you'd hear business owners potentially worried about that. Just certain people are going to get caught X, Y, Z, and then all of a sudden, you know, we become a unconsumer friendly town or X. Like, you, know, you got to worry about that a little bit, I think. So here's my issue with that. So we've got a situation where we're trying to solve a problem. But, uh, so you want to go into debt doing it because you don't want to raise fines hefty enough to pay for the enforcement of it because you're afraid you're going to tick people off and they're, I mean, it's, it's just like driving on the interstate during a snowstorm during uh, bad conditions you know, a ticket's still a ticket. You might run five other people off the road and get in a pileup uh, because of your foolishness to drive too fast and your ticket, if you get one ticket, might be 200 bucks. If it was $1,000 for driving too fast for the conditions, I can guarantee you I'm gonna drive below the speed limit and do whatever I need to do to, to drive responsibly. And uh, so that's kind of where we're coming, at, coming from here. But there's also the, the prevailing, um, again, it's not codified law, but when you talk to any lawyer about setting up uh, an ordinance, whether it's a speed ordinance or a parking ordinance, the, the main purpose of the ordinance is not to generate fine money. In a perfect world, you want an ordinance that people obey and you never have to write one ticket. I mean, if the state police are out there and if everybody's obeying the speed limit, they're going to see their revenues go down dramatically from what they are now, but it's a better and safer world. So a, a judge is going to tell you that the purpose of any ordinance is to protect the public safety and the public well-being. And enforcement is a part of it, but nobody's going to say you should be able to uh, you should be able to generate enough money through your enforcement to pay for it. So this letter right here is for the uh, application for the um, for a bench for out deck for one of the children, five children that got killed on the interstate. Okay. The legislative body up at the state house this year looked at raising the fine for using, um, was it for cell phone use, to 250 bucks, and somebody said that that was excessive, and I said to myself, so that's the value they're putting on a human life is 250 dollars. They're worried about impacting somebody's pocketbook when their foolishness of talking on the phone on the interstate could cause a collision that could kill somebody, and that's, they thought that $250 was excessive. I mean, that's the kind of mentality 
that we deal with in our society where you're trying to solve a problem, but you don't want to have the guts to do what needs to be done. All right, but there's a big difference between what your example you just gave and the one of, of, of illegal parking. So let's just bring that in. Well, I don't disagree parking. with you, but there's a big difference between somebody talking on a okay. cell phone, Talk driving their Zen. car, and parking a car illegally. Up here at the Zen Barn, when there's both sides of the road and you can't even squeeze through there. All right, well, that's some kind of... And that's another issue, just like he just showed us in that paper, All right. well, that somebody could get seriously hurt or even killed coming around that corner during one of those nights. Same kind of thing. Well, those aren't even legal parking spaces. Bill, can you remind us when you did, uh, when you actually went out to try to get a parking enforcement, would, would, I don't know if you call them officers, but uh, yeah. when, when, we, when we did that, what happened? How much were we offering to pay? And is that something we should just consider you know, putting out there again? I don't, you know, for something, some of this stuff, I think, even if we got one that came on for a couple months and then went away and we just kind of kept the open offer out there and people came and go into that role, just some of the sporadic enforcement of that might start to right some of this right. ship, right? Right. So it was when the police department was here, um, and I think we were offering fifteen dollars an hour. But you know, in the in the idea was, you know, I'm sure for the for the public, and I tried to spell it out in the ad. I probably still have the ad somewhere. You know, we were probably willing to hire a couple of people because to do it, you have to be out there enough to be consistent. But obviously, we weren't looking to hire somebody 40 hours a week to go out there and do this. You know, we wanted a couple of hours a day. And we, you know, ideally, we were looking for somebody who, you know, maybe was retired and was looking to earn a little extra money and, you know, today and tomorrow they might decide to go out there at 10 o'clock in the morning and next week they go out there at 4 to 6 in the afternoon. Um, uh, and, and we just didn't, you know, we weren't able to attract anybody. And it may have been because the police department was here and the, at the time the police department was not held in high esteem and maybe people just didn't want to work you know, and report to the chief of police. I don't, I don't know. You know, people don't typically call you up and say, well, I didn't apply because, you know, they just didn't apply. Do you think it's something that could be added on or made part of somebody else's job that already works for the town? No, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's conceivable. I um, think people would hate yeah, you. Challenge. <laughs> yeah. Just a question. Yeah, I, I just brought it up now really more to plant the seed. I didn't think that anybody would want to do it, you know, kind of completely out of the budget. Um, but I think going forward, it's something that we need to think about a little bit. Like a six hours a week, I just did quick, it was like six hours a week, 52 weeks a year at $15 an hour is like 4,700 bucks a year. So for under $5,000 a year, we could, I think as long as you just do it enough to get the word around right. town that tickets are popping up on people's cars, people start to, the, that word starts yeah, to and, spread. And so I think that would be at. where you don't want this position to break the bank, but I think there's a way to, I think part of the reason why we don't have that is that we haven't gone out back out looking for someone to fill that role, yeah, but if I, we. I can't remember, I think I was advertising for like 10 hours a yeah. or something like that. So I'll agree with that, Mark. I mean, if you can somehow incorporate, get a, a valuation on how many possible tickets would be handed out uh, and somehow do the formula to come up with a reasonable ticket fee uh, and make those numbers work. But I'm not interested in, and I don't know that the other two board members that are here tonight are not interested in taking on more debt without uh, a revenue source for it. Yeah, I would like to see what our current fine structure is for Arcane. All right. And I apologize, Jane, for me being a little bit uh, overzealous, but I'm tired of being responsible for everybody else's irresponsibility. I mean, those people ought to know that are parked side the road up there that, uh, you know, 
fire trucks and other emergency vehicles can't get through, but they go ahead and do it anyway. Well, I mean, look, just count the signs that say no parking. Yeah, yeah I'm, not defending, these. I'm not defending these. I'm not defending these. And and Mark made a good point that without any regulation, people can park overnight. They can park for months, and no one's gonna no one's gonna challenge them. So. Well, I, yeah, I think there's rules in place. They just ignore them. Right. So. Right. They ignore it's them called because irresponsibility. They, they know there's no enforcement. Right? Yes. Yeah. That's. You know, this is always, even when the police were here, I mean, and then, you know, the police would go up there. I, I remember probably three years ago, um, the police went up on one of these days, and man, the phone rang for three days. People all upset because, you know, some people got towed. Some people, the, they're getting out of the car, and the police officer told them, hey, there's no parking there. And they just looked at it and said, well, my kid's got a program. I'm going in to watch it. And when they came out, the car was gone. And they, were, <laughs> they were pretty mad. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks. Yes. OK. The rest is yours, Bill. Rotary Club request. <laughs> OK. Um, the Rotary Club, um, they did the not quite Independence Day celebration last year at Rusty Parker Park. Um, they did not request a closed Rotarian Way last year, which is the little road that runs from Park Row over to Park Street and Moody Court and right in front of the railroad station. Uh, they would like to close it this year um, uh, just because it would make a, they feel a better entryway and then, you know, shepherding people through the gates and everything that they had there. Um, I think for one day it's it's okay. Um, the people from Moody Court or Park Street can still get out to Main Street. Getting home is the difficulty, and I think that um, you know we might have to work with them to say we'll let you close the street down, but you need to have somebody there that's able to move a barricade. And yeah. if somebody is coming home to uh, house on Moody Court and they want to get home, they probably shouldn't be expected to, you know, park over beside the railroad station. So maybe they could keep it clear just so that when those cars come, they could allow them through. So <laughs> if you want to make it on that condition that they have to uh, accommodate, accommodate local traffic, yeah. local residents, um, if you want to make a motion to do that, I'll work with them. And if they can't do that, then we'll just say you can't close it. Yeah, I don't think there's a timeline, right? It has to be kind of, they have to have somebody there for the entire time Yeah, they, time they'll frame. have to have Don't put any there. structures in place so yeah. a car can get through. I, I would be in favor of that. And they could even meet with those residents and find out what their plans are for the day. Somebody would love to make a motion to that? I'll make a motion to Request. allow could closing... Can I suggest a different alternative? Sure. What if would they we what if they just closed Park Row off from Park Row restaurant down to Main Street? Because then you would still be able to access all of the residential by coming up around. It's a long way, either. No, but you would if you basically were the Park Row Cafe to Main Street. In, Moody Court people would, could go over down railroad, come over the railroad, and then get to their house. They could get out. There would be no problem. You could basically permanently set up Park Row without having to worry about trying to get a car through there in the middle of like I just worry about the scenario of like having to move barricades, and there's, if it's as busy as yeah, they hope it, it to be, yeah. trying to walk a car through a bunch of people is, to me, not necessarily the best strategy there. Where at Park Row, there's no residential right there. and. I don't know how much those businesses would be against it, probably give them more visibility to whatever the party is, but it wouldn't, I just don't know how you would do it the other way with the one way being that other road. Okay. Um, well then if you wanted to make a motion to authorize me to work with the Rotary Club to make something that's workable, understanding that residents have to get in and out. Um, Could we offer up with the motion Park Row as an alternative? Yeah, sure. If if we're all in agreement that that would also be okay. So then you that can make the motion or workable. 
I mean, maybe they could permanently leave one. Um, I'll make a motion to allow the Rotary Club to close either Rotarian Way or Park Row. Um, Rotarian Way only if they can come up with a, a plan for Moody Court residents or anyone else on that. Yeah, it's not circle. only Moody Court. Right, it's that rest of that other one way, right? Street too. Because yeah, it's a one way street. I'll second that. Carla? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so Jane seconded it. Yeah. Uh, any further discussion? Um, okay. All those who wish to approve it, say aye, please. Aye. 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 So uh, tax anticipation borrowing, uh, you've already authorized tax anticipation borrowing uh, between to and from the uh, utility district and the town has been borrowing from the utility district uh, probably borrowed a couple hundred thousand dollars now um, as I said you know we came into the year with the uh, lowest fund balance that we had in a long time it probably didn't uh, budget well enough as far as the interest expense for tax anticipation borrowing we only budgeted twenty five hundred dollars I'm sure we'll go over that but there's other places that we can squeeze that I don't think it's going to be exorbitant. It's not going to be problematic. But um, the utility district has recently made some loans from the UDAG fund, which is where the town has been borrowing from. Uh, and because they've made some loans, they don't have much more that the town is able to borrow. So. Uh, we worked with the People's United Bank and um, we've secured a line of credit for $1.4 million at two and three quarter percent. Um, and uh, it's, the maturity date is December 30th. Um, we're limited to the number of advances that we can take monthly. They have to, we can do two draws a month. They have to be at least $50,000. Uh, so I would just ask that you make a motion to authorize this tax anticipation borrowing and then sign the note and uh, resolution where indicated um, and we'll clearly only borrow if necessary. But I want to have that ability to borrow from the bank since it looks like the EFUD won't have enough to keep us in total Here you go, Chris. Somebody wish to make that motion then, please? I'll make a motion to allow tax anticipation borrowing as described by Bill. <laughs> Thanks. So there's several places there you've got to see. Yep. I'll second. second. Okay. Any further discussion? No. All those in favor say aye. 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 I didn't want to go signing it before we voted on it. Yeah. <laughs> Thing on the agenda, legal yep. action against the town. Yeah, you don't have to go into executive session. Josh can stay to this. I'll <laughs> wait for you folks to. Um, <laughs> sign off. And That's three signatures. Yeah, three places, right? Yeah, my pen screwed up on me there in the first one. Nothing made anything better. Thank you. You don't make nothing good anymore, not even pens. Thanks. So um, just to report, uh, the Human Rights Commission has decided to file suit against us. Uh, we decided at the last meeting uh, that we were going to reject the, um, <coughs> the, the last um, offer of a settlement. And all I'm doing now is just reporting to you that they have filed suit. Uh, unless the board directs otherwise, I'm going to just uh, waive the service requirement. The law says that if you sue, 
the county sheriff has to come out and give you a summons and tell you that you've been sued. Um, but if you waive service, you actually have a longer period of time in which to respond to the suit. So waiving service is to our advantage. If they serve you, you got to end up, they file a motion that you have to pay for the service. So it's cheaper to do it this way. Um, but I, what I wanted to let you know was that there was speculation in the newspaper, mainly from the other party to the suit, that the suit would be filed in federal court. But the suit has been filed in the Washington unit of the Superior Court, State of Vermont. Uh, the Human Rights Commission has their authority through the Vermont legislature and Vermont statutes. So they're, they're suing under state law. It's not, they have not filed a federal complaint. And from what I understand, the Human Rights Commission doesn't have standing to file in federal court um, if the uh, if the aggrieved party uh, wanted to file in federal court his own suit, he could, he could do that if he chose. But it's been filed in uh, Washington Superior Court, and um, I will direct the, uh, our attorney to waive the service requirement. Um, and then I think we'll have about 60 days to respond. <laughs> At some point, I'll have some information for you from our insurance company with regard to, um, you know, uh, if there's a reservation of rights letter written, uh, I've informed the insurance company that the suit has been filed. Um, and, and, you know, they're working to make sure that uh, they, um, they follow what the policy is and, and uh, you know, the, the suit has been filed, and, and I know we've gone through months of trying to come to a settlement, but I can guarantee you that will be the first directive of the judge, will be you need to try to mediate this and keep it out of court. So we're probably going to get back into a situation where we're trying to come to a, a settlement that doesn't require a trial. but. That step has been taken, and we're on that path. That's it. Do we need to do anything with this? No, it's going to be on the next agenda. It's on the okay. next. Yeah. And I didn't get one. I know they didn't drop one off for you, but you were CC'd on it. But I emailed it to you. Okay. Okay. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I was just going to say, I guess we're done. So. Motion to adjourn would be appropriate. And a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank and you we all. Made it, we made it on time. Believe it or not. Eight. 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 So. Eight.